Greetings, everyone. Hope all of you are having an absolutely fantastic day. Last year, we did a full live stream playthrough of Pillars of Eternity 1 and 2 back to back. We did a ton of content for one, but I got distracted by some other games and we never really dug into Deadfire. I want to make sure we fix that in 2024, starting with this review, and then I'll absolutely release a new player's guide along with a full class ranking. If there's any other content regarding Pillars of Eternity 2 or frankly any other game that you'd like to see, please leave me a comment down below. Here at Slandered Gaming, we focus on CRPGs, so if that kind of content interests you, please be sure to leave a like and subscribe for more videos. As I do with all my reviews, let's start with what I like about this game. Playing Pillars of Eternity 1 and 2 back to back is a jarring experience because the production values for the second game are way up. Visually, Deadfire looks significantly better and the use of color most especially is striking. Many of the scenes look like they are ripped straight from a painting. There was a huge focus in the prequel on establishing a gritty feel and that could cause some areas to look bland. Everything in Deadfire pops off the screen, whether you are walking around in a city, searching an underground cave, or fighting for your life in the middle of a desert. Nearly all the characters are voice acted, which by itself is a major improvement over the original game. Pillars of Eternity 1 had a weird issue where developer Obsidian randomly decided which lines did or did not warrant voice acting. Sometimes there were pivotal moments with no voice acting while throwaway lines had a voice. Even worse, sometimes there were long, odd pauses before a person's voice was heard. All of this is completely cleared up in Deadfire, and conversations flow much more smoothly. Even better, a lot of care went into the voices, so characters from different regions all sound distinctly different, and it helps to add more personality to all the different factions that you'll meet. A big reason the voices work so well is that multiple members of the popular Critical Role web series serve as talent, including Matt Mercer, Laura Bailey, and Liam O'Brien. The standout of the group is Ashley Suzanne Johnson, who serves as the narrator for your journey. In most text-heavy games, even if there is voice acting, the player is forced to read supplemental information describing each scene. For major story beats, Obsidian employed Ashley to set the stage and read all the dialogue that brings those scenes to life. This will be a very familiar tactic for anyone who has played Baldur's Gate 3 and heard Amelia Tyler's outstanding work narrating that game. The results in Deadfire are equally phenomenal, and anytime you start hearing Ashley's voice, you know something incredible is about to happen. The last note I'll make regarding the production values is that this game leans heavy into a pirate theme that permeates everything you see. While pirates are very popular, it's also very easy to get that theme wrong, and I give Obsidian a ton of credit for absolutely nailing it in this game. From the clothes, to the ships, to the accents, to the guns, it feels like Pillars of Eternity was meant to be played this way, and it works extremely well. Moving on to other areas, I also like the wealth of options Pillars of Eternity 2 provides when spinning up a new game. It starts with deciding whether or not you want your adventure to be real-time with pause or turn-based. In my opinion, real-time with pause is a superior option, since the game was built from the ground up to be played that way. Despite that, there are certainly a lot of players who find that playstyle to be intimidating and strongly prefer turn-based encounters, so it's really cool that players can choose. Keep in mind that some mechanics, especially those regarding speed, will work differently in turn-based combat. Once this choice is selected, you could choose a difficulty, which ranges from story mode all the way to Path of the Dam. When the game first launched, it was way too easy, even at the highest difficulty, disappointing legions of fans. This has since been corrected, and while nobody will confuse this game for Underrail, it can certainly present a challenge. If you want more challenge than just the base difficulty, you can add Trial of Iron, which limits you to one save, and Expert Mode, which disables helper features in the game, 
forcing you to use your own intuition when solving quests. There's also a level scaling option that can either be applied to the entire game or specifically the main story path. On top of this, there is a Mogren's Fire system, which can provide you with unique challenges such as losing your turn if you don't act within 10 seconds or party members dying if they stay knocked out for more than 10 seconds. Finally, if you want to make things a little bit easier, you can select one of Barath's blessings. As you complete achievements in the game, you will gain currency that can be used when starting a new game to select one of these blessings. Each blessing has a specific cost and can provide bonuses such as starting the game at level 4, getting double skill bonuses from your class, or even unlocking a pet for your party member Edder. There's a wealth of cool options and you don't get enough currency to select them all, so it adds a wee bit of replayability into the game. Once you have finished with all of this, it's actually time to start a new game. Deathfire has, in my humble opinion, one of the best intros in all of gaming. Edder narrates a trailer that showcases your castle being overrun by a giant underground statue that suddenly springs to life after it is taken over by the deity Aeothus. This event is very powerful if you play Pillars of Eternity 1, but even if you haven't, it's pretty clear crap has hit the fan. The statue kills you and the game shifts to your soul slowly making its way to the wheel so it can be reborn as a new person. During this short walk, multiple clips play displaying signature scenes from the first game. These clips help to inform or remind players about critical lore in the Pillars world. Once you enter the wheel, your character meets Barak, the god of cycles, doors, and of life and death itself. Everything about this sequence is fantastic. The colors, the mystical setting, Ashley's narration, Barav's haunting voice, the manner in which the characters split up into two different people, it's all just crazy well done. Barav helps you import a world state from events in the first game. This is very important because even though you don't have to play Pillars 1 to understand Pillars 2, there are many decisions that have bearing on the sequel. Either you can transfer an ending save or select one of several possible world states that have been prepared for you. Importing a save is better because it takes more choices into account, but either way the process is smooth and simple. Once you've imported a world state, Barath gives you a mission you'll spend the entire game trying to complete. Aethys is using his new giant body to stomp towards an objective that is unclear to the rest of his deity peers. She wants you to track him down and find out what his goals are. I love that the game gives you the option to tell her to kick rocks, along with providing consequences for doing that. Once you accept her mission, you'll jump into the overall game. The main story isn't bad, but it's got issues, so we'll circle back to that discussion in the neutral section. Since we're on the subject of Barath, I think it's a great time to note that the way Deadfire handles its deities is absolutely phenomenal. In Pillars 1, you heard about these characters all the time, but you almost never spoke to them directly. In Deadfire, you speak to them all the time, and the conversations are consistently memorable. Each deity is a legend unto themselves, with a fully developed personality that is a joy to behold. Each of them has an incredibly detailed look, and the voice acting is solid throughout the whole group. All of them have quests where they'll drop in and have demands of you, or just monitor your actions with amusement. In my opinion, the standout of the group is Remergan, god of all forms of erosion and collapse, death, plague, famine, or just plain old bad luck are all part of his domain. It is so much fun to hate him. His conversations about how everything is going to end and there is no way to escape are so enthralling, and the character model is absolutely sick. Once you have finished receiving your mission, it's time to enter character creation, another area where Deadfire is significantly better from its predecessor. The list of races and sub-races is exactly the same, which is fine because Pillars already had a robust variety of options. The class mechanics is where things have been significantly improved. The list of classes remains the same, but the abilities have all been upgraded or changed in some manner. 
Even better, Deadfire introduces multi-classing, allowing you to either stick with one class or combine two of them to create a different option. Choosing multi-class prevents you from gaining abilities in the last two levels of the classes you have combined. The choice to go single or multi-class at the beginning of the game is final, so the system adds some degree of weight to character creation. To assist you in making that choice, Deadfire allows you to see the entire tree for all of the classes. This is a very welcome change from the first game and really helps players plan out their builds. Obsidian put a lot of effort into improving the exploration experience you get in Deadfire and it absolutely paid off. The game has a massive world map full of islands you can travel to. Everywhere you go, there are things that help to expand the world and provide more information regarding the lore. Most of these areas have small dungeons with dangerous creatures you can conquer and once that's done, you can actually give unmarked islands a name. Deadfire continues the pillar's tradition of providing a wealth of weapons, armor, and accessories to fit just about any build you can come up with. This makes it even more fun to fight through out-of-the-way encampments because you are never sure what useful equipment will pop up. Scattered everywhere are ships from friendly factions, rivals, or bounties you can attempt to claim. There are a ton of small text events that can be randomly triggered, highlighting dangers in the sea or presenting you with a choice on how to handle stressful situations. Traveling the world map is just a ton of fun all the way around. Another strong aspect of this game are the factions. There are four different factions vying for power, and all of them are led by strong, charismatic characters who are a lot of fun to align yourself with. Each group has a ton of history and culture that really fleshes out what they stand for. What really makes the system work so well is the writing, which gives all the factions very compelling reasons for why they should be in charge over and above their peers. You get four party members who each serve as a representative or frankly a flat out spy for a particular faction, providing a window into how the organization operates. Their personal quest will oftentimes provide more insight into their faction as well. This adds another layer to the different groups because you may strongly dislike a faction while having deep affection for your party member who is associated with them. No matter which camp you side with, it's almost certainly going to hurt when you have to destroy their rival. One place where Deadfire is significantly better than its predecessor is Party AI. The first game was terrible in this regard and really forced you to manually execute your entire party's commands. Deadfire provides an AI tactics menu that looks like it's ripped straight out of Dragon Age Origins. This is absolutely fantastic and makes it very easy to set your party up for maximum effectiveness. You are granted a ton of granular control over what abilities your party members use and which enemies they target. For those who don't want to be bothered with this, there are templates you can use so that the game will automatically give party members instructions. You can also toggle the AI off if you would like to take full manual control of your overall party. As you can probably tell by now, the music in this game is phenomenal. You've been hearing it in the background this entire video and truly it melts into every scene. Your crew will also sing shanties aboard your ship. In a really nice touch, the voices you hear will align with the genders of who is on your ship. So if you have an all-male crew, you'll hear all-male shanties and vice versa. It's a lot of fun to play around with this, and the songs are catchy, so the shanties really help to pull you into the setting. The last thing I really like about this game is the DLC. In addition to a few pieces of free DLC, Deadfire has three expansion packs. Seeker, Slayer, Survivor is highly focused on combat, and I found it rather mediocre. Beast of Winter and the Forgotten Sanctum are absolutely fantastic, with deep storylines that focus on two of the most interesting deities in the game world. Forgotten Sanctum in particular has a very challenging final encounter that the game handles flawlessly. Both of them are well worth playing again. There are a few things about this game I am neutral on. The first Pillars of Eternity is one of the darkest games I have ever played. You are literally trying to stop the murder of children. Deadfire is significantly lighter in tone and visual aesthetic. 
I think some aspects of this work very well. The game does look significantly better, and the pirate theme is great. That being said, in the process of creating such a drastic tone shift, Deadfire loses some of what made the original game so unique. I would argue the seriousness of Pillars of Eternity's story creates a game world that is unlike any other game you have played. I would be hesitant to say the same about Deadfire. Another area of the game I am neutral on is ship management. Like any true pirate game, Deadfire gives you a ship and lets you hire a crew. The ship is very customizable with a lot of different cannons, flags, and attachments you can find or purchase throughout the game world. There are also several different types of crew you can recruit, such as cooks, cannoneers, and navigators. Once again, you can find them throughout the game world, and sometimes it's really cool how they can be unlocked. All of these characters have different ratings and ways in which they can make your adventures out at sea much easier. It's your responsibility to keep your crew properly fed, and mutiny can occur if you run your ship poorly. All of this is pretty well done, and it's fun to make your ship the best that it can be. The problem is that ship combat, which is plentiful in the game, is absolutely terrible. Obsidian made it a text minigame, so you just click on words to move your ship 90 degrees or to fire your cannons. It feels very uninspired, to the point that an option was added in to just skip combat and immediately try to board every enemy ship. Personally, I consider going toe-to-toe -to -toe with other enemy ships a big part of being a pirate, and its poor implementation here puts a damper on the other aspects of ship management. Party members are another area of this game that I am neutral on. On the one hand, it's unquestionably a strong group. Three of the standout party members from the original return and are joined by the four faction representatives. Each of them has completely different personalities, backgrounds, and mechanics. Since the classes are so much stronger in this game, it becomes a lot of fun to try different combinations and put together the best party you can. There's also a long list of mercenaries you can recruit. These characters have their own set classes and they come with a little bit of dialogue and banter, although for the most part, they don't have personal quests. Consequently, the list of party members you can draw upon is larger than the first game. Deadfire also has romances, which the first game lacked. This is definitely an improvement and it's really nice that you can have a relationship with the majority of non merc companions. If this was not a Pillars game, I would absolutely put this party members group in the like section. The problem is that this is a Pillars game, and frankly, the content from this group pales in comparison to the original. Durant's and Grieving Mother are better written and developed than anybody you get. While Edda remains endearing, he's just not as good the second time around. Unless you side with her faction, it's difficult to unlock content for Palagina, and even if you do, she just doesn't seem to have as many conversations as her peers. Most of the romances feel like an afterthought and don't get nearly the amount of content you would see in a Dragon Age or Witcher game. Again, compared to most other RPGs, these party members are fantastic, but in a Pillars game from Obsidian, I found them to be a little underwhelming. The last area of the game I am neutral on is the main story. On the one hand, the campaign deeply involves the factions and deities that I've already mentioned are absolutely fantastic. There are some incredible set pieces, both visually and from a writing standpoint as well. Obsidian did a monumental job of crafting an experience that is very accessible to new players, and yet it doesn't grind the nerves of someone who played the original game. I literally played them back to back, and it felt like a seamless experience. Many other sequels don't handle this nearly as well. Unfortunately, the main arc is wrapped up in about five quests that take you around 10 hours to finish. This style of focusing mostly on side content and making the main story weak can work okay if the game has an incredible world and NPCs. While I immensely enjoy a lot of the side content Deadfire has to offer, it isn't quite strong enough to make up for what the main story lacks. Even more damaging, Deadfire ends on a cliffhanger that is deeply unsatisfying. Keep in mind, I am not one of those people who believes cliffhanger endings are bad in and of themselves. Inception, The Fellowship of the Ring, and The Empire Strikes Back all had fantastic cliffhanger endings. 
the popular TV show 24 arguably ended every episode with a cliffhanger and it was a great time following those stories. Deadfire's cliffhanger ending doesn't work because it presents a monumental choice but does a very poor job of showcasing the ramifications of your decision and consequently it feels like the story should have been longer. This is a baffling design choice in a 100 hour game whose main quest again only accounts for around 5 missions. Before we get into the dislike section, if you enjoy this content please leave a like and be sure to hit up the discord. We're a fun and laid back community who loves CRPGs and we'd be happy to welcome any other chill enthusiast. There are a couple aspects of the game that I don't like. The inventory system is absolutely atrocious. This was clearly a pain point in the first game and very little has been done to alleviate it here. The problem is not just that the system piles up all the armor and weapons together in an interface that is hard to sift through. It's also problematic because this game throws a ton of loot at you. Oftentimes after a dungeon, you'll have half a dozen of the same type of weapon or armor. The game doesn't necessarily stack these items into one slot, so they just fill up the inventory space, making it unnecessarily complicated to reach the gear that's actually an upgrade for you. Another aspect of this game that I don't like is how text heavy it is. Obviously, I have no problem with games where I have to read the dialogue and general information describing a scene. Deadfire takes it a step further by also littering the game world with random text-based events and also, as previously mentioned, making ship combat text-based as well. You basically need to constantly read and while much of the content is excellent, it can still get old after a while. I know many of you are going to roll your eyes at my last dislike, but I don't care. I'm a sucker for romances and games and the way they are handled matter to me. The fact that you are unable to romance Queen Onakaza is a crime and a shame. I hate it when games make the most interesting NPC non-romanceable while at the same time making it painfully obvious this person should be romanceable. It's hot garbage that she flirts with you and attempts to charm you into helping her, but there's no way for you to also sit on the throne beside her. That ends my review of Pillars of Eternity 2, Deadfire. In summary, it's one of the greatest CRPGs ever made. It also continues the story of one of the greatest CRPGs ever made, so bottom line, if you are a fan of the genre, this is a must play. Even if you aren't, Deadfire boasts incredible art, fantastic characters, and a vibrant game world that is a joy to explore. It has some weaknesses in its main arc, and the party members might not quite be up to snuff depending on what other games you have played, but these drawbacks don't stop it from being an incredible experience. Avowed has quite a bit to live up to, and I hope it continues the legacy of the previous two games set in the aura. Let me know down in the comments your thoughts on the review. Hope all of you enjoyed this video. Take care.